Good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to today's master talk. My name is Bernard, your uh, MC for today. Uh, before we start, I've got some, um, uh, I will ask you to collaborate, uh, cooperate for the following uh, issues. Um, please, uh, no eating or drinking during uh, the presentation. And I would like to uh, ask you to switch your mobile phones to a silent mode. And there will be a Q&A session and an author. Um, um, and I would like you to, um, to stand up if you would like to ask questions during uh, the Q&A session. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, 2012 is Hong Kong Design Year. And it is going to be a very exciting year for all of us in Hong Kong. Uh, do you remember, do um, you know the, the slogan uh, of uh, Hong Kong Design Year? Uh, one, two, three, <coughs> together. <laughs> a city created, an activity run by design, and Chinese, any, anybody? Okay, it's Tom Yi Seng Si, Chit Kai Koi Dong, okay? So uh, after uh, this part of the talk, I hope uh, you will remember the slogan and to spread the word uh, across. Um, as, as I said, it's going to be a very exciting year for all of us. And we will have a very strong lineup of uh, signature events and celebratory activities throughout the year uh, to cultivate a design vision for Hong Kong. Um, as a flagship event of Hong Kong Design Year program presented by Great Hong Kong, organized by Hong Kong Design Center, along with our strategic partners, including um, Hong Kong uh, TDC. Hong Kong, uh, uh, Hong Kong Tourism Board and Ambassador of Design. Um, the Master Talk uh, series invites world-class design masters from various design disciplines who share their experience and insight with the public. The aim is to inspire and enhance society-wide understanding of the value of design in all walks of life. And today, we are very honored to have two distinguished speakers from the U.S., Mr. Edward Fula and Ms. Cheryl Kent. They will share with us how a cultural park can work magic for a world-class city in many different aspects, with the Millennium Park as a case in point. To kick off our first session of the Master Talk series, I'm inviting Dr. Victor Lowe, Chairman of Hong Kong Design Center, to come to the stage and say a few words to us. Welcome, Dr. Lowe. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, on behalf of the Design Center, <coughs> uh, thank you all for attending this afternoon. Uh, well, uh, a few years ago, I invited Edward Ulliard to come to the Business of Design Week to, to give a talk about the Millennium Park. Um, well, I, I didn't know Edward then, so I asked my good friend in Chicago, Cheryl, to introduce me. Uh, but since then, we, we became friends. And uh, well, the Millennium Park is one of my favorite uh, projects of its kind in the world. <coughs> um, and I think in many ways uh, they have a lot of valuable experience that uh, hopefully they can share with us in Hong Kong. Particularly we're now f going full speed ahead uh, to try and implement the West Kowloon Cultural District. And we have the, um, the KaiTech project, Southeast Kowloon. And we also have a lot of new development along the, the waterfront. So I, I think the Millennium Park is, has been an amazing success. Um, it now has more than 4 million visitors visiting the Millennium Park <coughs> each year. And also the Millennium Park has a lot of similarity to West Kowloon, I think. First of all, it's, it, it, it puts a lot of emphasis on arts and culture. And secondly, unlike the, uh, the High Park in London or the Central Park in New York, uh, the Millennium Park is not surrounded by established neighborhoods. And, and and that is some similarity with West Kowloon too. I think that, that's, that's strategically quite a challenge for, for West Kowloon. Um, and also, um, I think it's interesting that um, <coughs> in the Millennium Park uh, experience, I find it very interesting that 
is not just the, the city government planning and building the park, but it's, it's years of uh, very intensive collaboration between government, the public sector, business, and the arts and culture community, <coughs> and education as well. So I think that that aspect of Millennium Park is, is extremely interesting for us. Um, and also the, the impact of the Millennium Park to the, the economy, particularly to to the development sur surrounding the park. So uh, I, I, I hope we'll, we'll, we'll get a lot of insights from, uh, from, from Edward and, and from Cheryl today. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this session. Um, this is the first of our Hong Kong Design Year Master Talks. Uh, we hope to have at least one exciting Master Talk every month from this month onwards. So we have Toyomito coming in April and we have many more exciting uh, speakers to follow. So I hope you enjoy this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lo. Uh, now I would like to introduce our moderator for today, uh, Dr. Eric Sudenfry and Ms. Ms. Uh, Marisa Yu. Um, thank you, Eric. I'd like to introduce our, our two speakers uh, for today. Our first speaker uh, we're very, very pleased to have with us is Edward Uller. Uh, he's renowned for being the director of design of the Millennium Park Project, and he's currently the executive director of the Millennium Park Incorporated. And he has this responsibility, this great responsibility, of managing the improvement of the park, the continuous improvement of the public art, and also the gardens. He represents the park together with the mayor, various government agencies, and also manages the staff, as well as the budget, directing the design and additions and improvements to the park. So together with the mayor, he's really assisting the city in really bringing on the programming and the, the further development of how the park operates within the heart of the city. As the president of Uller Consulting, he provides services to several public organizations uh, around uh, the US and public planning uh, for parks and development of them. He's also a professor, a adjunct professor of architecture at the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. For his work, he's received many, many honors, including the Burnham Award for Excellence in Planning, the American Society of Landscape Architects National Honor Award for Lincoln Park Framework Plan, the Chicago Civic Foundation Urban Innovation Award, and the Friends of Downtown Award for Lifetime Achievement. He is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, and I believe trained as an architect, and, uh, and has been uh, recognized by the Chicago chapter, who pre presented him with a Distinguished Service Award in 1999. Together, Edward Uller and the Million Park have received over 40 different awards, including the Barrier Free American Award and American Institute of Architects National Honor Award for Urban Design. He also serves uh, the community as a Secretary for Neighbor Space, a Chicago Land Trust, and community gardens, and also the secretary of the, the City Parks Alliance, a nationwide or organization that advocates for urban parks. Our second speaker, Cheryl Kent, has been writing about architecture, design, and cities for over 25 years. Uh, such great books such as uh, Santiago Cabotrabo's Milwaukee Art Museum, and another book on the new Spartacus Institute. Her most recent work, which I, I have here uh, with me, uh, looks really deeply at the, the Chicago's Millennium Park. And for this book, Ken interviewed over 100 people and really explains how the, the park and each of its features came into being. You'll find that the story within this book is very amazing. It really looks into turning these obstacles into opportunity. So each chapter takes on a new look, looking into Frank Gehry's uh, pavilion or Anish Kapoor's cloud gate and really describing this urban change and really taking a very conventional program initially and showing how it would transform into these extraordinary pieces uh, that are really world renowned as well. And really showing the individuals, uh, the individual people who really invested so much into this. Uh, for this uh, work, Ken has been awarded a grant by the National Endowment for the Arts in support of her research for architecture 
and she continues to write for such magazines and newspapers as the New York Times, the International Herald Tribune, Architectural Record, and Progressive Architecture. Please join me in welcoming Cheryl Kent and Edward Uller to the Master's Talk Series. Thank you. fourth trip here now. And uh, I really, I'm getting to know the city and enjoying it very much. My daughter, who goes to a school in Shanghai and was her first trip here uh, to join me, uh, said, uh, as far as she's concerned, it is the best city in China. So, so I'm going to, uh, Cheryl and I are sort of teaming this up. So uh, uh, I'm going to start out talking about uh, the process, uh, first of all, a little bit of history and the process of creating Wanning Park, and then Cheryl's going to talk about some in individual projects, and I'm going to finish up with uh, uh, sort of the economic impact and, and some of the programming we do. So uh, Wanning Park is situated pretty much right in the center of the city. Um, it's where I'm circling here with the, with the laser pointers, exactly where Wanning Park is. And the railroads um, came into the city in the 1850s uh, and made, um, it gave Chicago an opportunity to become uh, a major force in commerce in the Midwest. And it was this juxtaposition of the railroad, the uh, i &M Canal Corridor, which connects the Mississippi River and Lake Michigan. Uh, Chicago, after the railroads came in, Chicago grew very rapidly. And uh, this is a plan that was created for um, Grant Park, which is the front yard of Chicago, by Edward Bennett, who was uh, one of the partners of, of Daniel Burnham. Daniel Burnham did the plan of Chicago, which we just celebrated in 2009, the 100th anniversary. Uh, the park Grand Park, this is, started construction in, in uh, 1917. The first part was uh, along Michigan Avenue. And uh, by 1927, the park was fairly finished. Um, you can see Buckingham Fountain, which is the major fountain in, in the middle of Grand Park, which is, I, I should mention that this plan was based on formal French planning, Beaux-Arts planning, and um, Daniel Burnham and Edward Bennett were, were sort of really tied into this idea. And uh, it, it, it is a problem for, for Grand Park because when you do this formal planting, if there's any problem <coughs> with the health of uh, a, a single stand of trees like the American elm, you pretty much wipe out the entire landscape. But the, Grand, the uh, uh, fountain Buckingham Fountain was based on a fountain at, at Versailles called Latona Fountain, except in Chicago it had to be bigger. The uh, Buckingham Fountain is a model for Millennium Park because it was totally funded by a private donor, Kate Buckingham, to honor her dead brother. But the real important thing about the uh, donation was she also made an uh, endowment. And the endowment, uh, actually, uh, of four hundred thousand dollars, was able to pay for a eight million dollar restoration of the fountain about uh, ten years ago. But the railroad still occupied all of the land uh, north of uh, the Art Institute, which is right here, and uh, it wasn't until um, in the seventies that most of that was sold off. Uh, the railroad owned all of this property, and it's now a, a huge development. Uh, gradually, uh, land was uh, uh, taken over from the railroad and developed this park space. And this was the site of Monty Park in uh, the 1998. 
it was a surface parking lot for about 900 vehicles, and uh, there's a also next to the parking lot is a huge uh, railroad uh, ter uh, terminus. Uh, fortunately, it's electric train. And there is an urban legend that um, Mayor Daly's uh, dentist was in this building, and every time, presumably, he was practicing good dental hygiene every six months, he had to look out on the site and uh, see this awful site. Uh, it was uh, an impediment to getting into Grand Park from the rest of the central business district, and it was pretty ugly. And of course, from 16 floors up, you got a, a, a more terrible view of the site. So he directed uh, the uh, staff of the uh, law department to figure out a way to get control of the site. Well, for 30 years, uh, there were discussions about taking over this property and making a park. But the railroad said, you can do that, but we own the land and um, it's going to cost millions of dollars. So the project never went forward until a bright attorney at the park district uh, uh, did some research and found out the city actually owned all the land, <laughs> including the land under the tracks. So um, the city filed a lawsuit, and um, soon after that, the railroad had to give up and turn over. They were actually subleasing this to a parking operator, and they had to turn that over, and money park could go forward with the design. The other principal reason for uh, money park was to create a new music venue, and this one was built in 1978. It's the Petrillo Shell. Uh, it replaced one that was built in 1930. Uh, it's the home of the Grand Park Symphony Orchestra, which is now in their uh, 78th year. But it had, uh, it became not the home of the orchestra, but the home of every festival that occurs in Chicago. Totally inadequate for, for the use it was put to. Uh, this is a, uh, Chicago has a tendency to celebrate the 4th of July and the 3rd of July. I don't know why, but, um, and this is that celebration. So this was the plan that was developed uh, in 1997, uh, prepared by Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill. The idea was you would build a new garage, a new garage, and that garage would provide enough revenue that you could sell bonds and build not in the garage, but the park on top of it. And um, they would then uh, build, with the existing garage that was also currently under the park, they would uh, attach that with a 16-acre park. And um, that was the plan. Uh, they uh, went back to that Beaux-Arts um, uh, sort of arrangement. And their plan reflected uh, this French formal planning. It had some problems. Um, mainly that there were areas of plan where this stairway is with the overlook that you could not get to if you were in a wheelchair. And uh, the United States has a law called the American with Disabilities Act. If you build a public project and you prohibit somebody with a wheelchair from having access, you potentially can break the law and be fined. So it was shortly after this that uh, Mayor Daly asked me to um, fix the project. And he might fix the accessibility parts of it. So I was hired, and unfortunately, we started construction um, one week after I started. Um, <laughs> constructing the underpinnings of the park. There was going to be a huge garage. Uh, this is the morning garage, uh, just before they started putting caissons in. The existing uh, North Underground Garage is right here, which also extends underneath the roadway. And uh, this is a later uh, photograph showing that garage being demolished because uh, one of the things that Skid Row and Merrill neglected to tell the mayor is that existing garage, which was built in 1953, was ready to fall in. And uh, if you hadn't dealt with it, as part of this project, it would have been a political embarrassment for the mayor to have to go back a few years later and then demolish and, and rebuild it. So we added that to the project. And you can see the 960 caissons that are going in uh, over the railroad tracks. And this is the other garage being built. Um, there's two garages, 4,000 parking spaces under the park, uh, separated by that active railroad line. 
the difficulty of constructing this park was considerable because of the railroad. And the railroad has 4,000 commuters coming and going every day, so uh, you could only build uh, at night over the railroad tracks, and uh, it was very, very expensive. I'm moving a little farther along with construction now. All the top raft slab, they call it, is, is done. Uh, a series of, of steel structure, uh, precast concrete structure, and precast cast in place concrete made up all of the elements uh, to, to make this raft slab complete. Uh, we received uh, quite a bit of criticism uh, because uh, uh, from the ground level, no one could actually see all this work that was going on uh, under uh, the, the ground. And it was taking a few years to get to a point where there was actually something that people could see. So we decided to uh, open up parts of the park, uh, gradually starting at Michigan Avenue and then uh, moving to the east. And uh, we even greened up areas just so the public could use it. And this might be a lesson for uh, West Colum Project too, to try to get something going as soon as possible um, mm -hmm. and get the public uh, involved in, in going to that site. And, uh, and then this is almost at the end, end of completion. Uh, this is uh, about probably six months before the park opened. So this long history, the five and a half years of construction, uh, definitely was a problem uh, for me and the mayor. Uh, the press um, was initially told the project would cost $125 million. Uh, it would be done in a year and a half. And of course, five and a half years later it opened. Uh, but uh, because of that, the press was relentless in their criticism of the project, uh, saying it was a project out of control, a boondoggle, um, never really wanting to understand that it was a total change in scope. Uh, the project expanded by 50%. There were two garages instead of one that were being built. Uh, that didn't matter. They just liked to criticize the mayor. <laughs> So I'm going to take a quick uh, tour of the park. Uh, the Harris Theater was the first thing that we added um, beyond what SOM had proposed. It's a, a theater that's underground. Uh, a local architect designed it, and we, he designed it in another site, and so he wanted to bring that same aesthetic over to Monument Park to match the Bozai's plan that SOM had done. Uh, this was his initial sketch, a very classical uh, piece of architecture, which I hated. But we, we, we couldn't do much about it just at this moment. So it really turned out to be a much more uh, uh, contemporary in its ultimate design. It was um, sunken underground so we could cover it with, with landscape. There were some legal reasons to do that. And uh, this is the uh, entry pavilion, which is, um, um, had to have some presence on the site. So you go in and you go down. Uh, three uh, levels to get to the main floor. Uh, Tom Beebe, because he designed that, we also had to design these two pavilions called the Exxon Pavilions on each side of the, of the project. And those pavilions were funded by the electric company in, in Chicago because uh, we tried to find something that uh, they could um, underwrite. So for $5 million, they were able to put their name on the Exxon Pavilions. These the buildings are clad with photocells, so even though not, the orientation isn't very good for the sun, but uh, it was a demonstration project. They could prove to the citizens of Chicago that they were sensitive about uh, alternate energy, even though they're really not. But uh, we took their $5 million dollars and we built these buildings. Uh, the, the major music show was uh, designed, of course, by uh, Frank Gehry and B.P. Bridge. Uh, Frank Gehry um, initially came up with this design, um, which he called his overture Denise Van Der Rohe. Uh, he really liked this design. Uh, the Pritzker family, which um, uh, provided the money uh, for the naming rights, $15 million, um, when they took a look at this, they said, this isn't Frank. So we got this instead. Um, we were willing to cooperate with the, with the Pritzker family because $15 million is a you know, substantial sum. 
Uh, they also, Frank also designed the bridge. Um, the interesting thing about this is that uh, um, SOM had done the original design uh, for a bridge, and I was instructed to go out to meet Frank Gehry in California and, and talk him into doing this project because uh, Cindy Pritzker, who, who saw the original design, uh, was not uh, very much in favor of it. So here you see the, the Frank Gehry's design sort of touching the a Harris Theater, um, they back up against one another, and they share all the backstage space. So the outdoor pavilion only is really good for concerts during the summer. It's too cold in Chicago in the winter. So uh, it's, they switch over the facility so the Harris Theater becomes the principal user of the backstage support. And uh, so this is the construction of uh, the big, huge cantilever, 100 feet and some of the other construction photos of the bridge going in place. And uh, the reason we got all this money, this is the, uh, the Paris Dome being torn down in 1953. We brought it back as the place to acknowledge the donors who, given, who gave money to the project. So we had 115 donors. Uh, if they gave more than $5 million, they got their name on um, an element in the park, like the Wrigley Square. There are 10 of those in the park. And this is the sort of uh, how the donors' funding uh, uh, settled up. They gave $220 million for the project. All the elements in the park were, were pretty much done by donors. The city uh, provided $270 million, so the total cost of the project was $490 million U.S. Uh, that also includes an endowment, uh, also raised by the donors of, of about $25 million. Some of the other elements were the Harris or the McCormick Tribune ice rink, which converts to outdoor dining in the summer. I'm going faster now because um, they keep showing me how many minutes I have left. <laughs> <laughs> and not many left. So, a little garden. We had a uh, competition for the garden. Uh, we had a donor who, uh, who provided money to. Um, to do an invited competition, which might, I know we're doing competitions for West Kowloon. Uh, this was the SOM scheme, which everyone hated. So the competition <laughs> allowed us to uh, invite uh, 17 landscape architects from around the world. We paid them an honorarium, they did schemes. We had a couple of them. This is a um, Dan Kiley scheme, uh, who was uh, past his, his, his prime in his career. He couldn't remember anything about the scheme when we invited him to talk about it. <laughs> and the jury thought it looked like a set from Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> uh, but the winner was um, uh, Catherine Gustafson from Seattle, Washington, who had an incredible uh, understanding of uh, what a uh, perennial garden would be. She included uh, on her team uh, Pete Udoff, who's the plantsman who really created this wonderful uh, environment. Uh, this is the um, uh, maquette that Manish Kapoor did for uh, Cloudgate, uh, the uh, structure uh, underneath uh, that, all that metal was done by Eric from, uh, and this is the uh, Cloudgate being constructed on site. Very difficult, Manish said it would be five million, it wound up costing 23 million, but worth every penny. <laughs> because uh, it is now the icon that identifies Chicago to the world. Um, it was built under a tent on site. Uh, the reason it cost so much is no one had ever achieved anything like this. Uh, it was made of 168 individual plates that are all welded together. And that welding, grinding, and polishing took a lot of labor, two, and a half, two years of labor. Uh, this is Anish Kapoor seeing it for the first time. He's not a hands on artist, so he walked into the tent, and uh, I will. Uh, I was there, and I will repeat the now famous quote from Anish, it's frickin' big. <laughs> uh, this was the fountain that was designed by SOM, once again a very disappointment. Um, so we hired uh, uh, Joe McPlant, so this is his initial sketch to do the fountain. Um, he had this incredible idea, this is computer rendering, to do these glass towers 50 feet high with faces of Chicagoans. And uh, this is the structure that's inside those towers. And construction was, uh, was pretty rapid and difficult. All right, I guess that's when Cheryl takes over. <laughs> Unfortunately, I put a bit of blank, blank side there.
First thing I want to say is what an honor it is to be here speaking to you and, and um, in reference to the great project you're doing on West Calhoun. I can't tell you how exciting it is for me. Um, the uh, first time I started traveling in Asia was in the um, late 1980s. And people would say to me, you know, usually trying to practice their English, where are you from? And I'd say Chicago, and they'd go, <coughs> Alcohol. <laughs> and um, in the 90s, they would ask me this question, and, and I would say Chicago, and they would say, Michael Jordan, <laughs> which was, to my mind, a big improvement in sports about over again. <laughs> but um, it's my hope, and uh, I, I have to test this theory out, but it's my hope that this beautiful sculpture will be what reminds people of Chicago in the future. Um, Chicago uh, was, its uh, earlier name that people know it by was uh, as Hog Butcher to the World. And um, that is just sort of emblematic of the way cities change and, and these names ref reflect those changes. Um, Chicago was always a very hard-working city. Um, the transportation, grain, and uh, the stockyards, all of that. Um, but Chicago reinvented itself many times, three times. The first one came with the Chicago Fire, which just annihilated the city. And uh, it was a pretty lame city at that point, mostly shacks. And people were coming to Chicago to work and to make money. And there, were, there was no grid. There was, it, was, it was bad. Well, with the fire, we ended up acquiring the, the great architecture of Louis Sullivan and others, and that was our first reinvention. The second came in 1893 with the World's Columbian Exposition and the White City. Um, by that time, Chicago had become a little more sophisticated. Uh, the businessmen in, um, who had made pots of money in Chicago had become philanthropists, and they endowed the, the symphony. They endowed the Art Institute. They endowed the, the opera. And in 1893, Chicago invited the world to come and see that it wasn't hog butcher of the world anymore. It wasn't a cow town either. Um, so the trick is in um, reinventing that people don't always see things the same way, right? Um, in the late 80s, I, I, for a friend in, in, on mainland China, I agreed to pick up a student who was coming to study at the University of Chicago. I came, went to pick her up at the airport and bring her to the university. And <clears throat> I apologized to her because we were coming through this area, oops, sorry, coming through an area of Chicago that is not very attractive. And I said, oh, you know, just wait. And then I drove her by uh, the lake, where we have over 20 miles of beautiful green parks. And I said, see, isn't this beautiful? I think it's great. And she said, that looks like a really big waste of land to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, it's interesting, right? I mean, um, it reminds you that the Victorians in London thought that smokestacks were beautiful. So, um, in Europe and North America, the way we think about parks is in relationship originally to the uh, European square. It's a place where people meet, and it's a place for schmoozing. And it has also acquired a connotation of being um, emblematic of a democratic country. You see people unlike yourself, you recognize them, and you become more equal. And it was also more literally just a place to um, express your opinions. So it became associated with democracy. Um, and Millennium Park is kind of a willful reinvention for the 21st century. Uh, it's not exactly a green park, but it has that. It's not about sports. It is about performance, it has that, but that's not at all about. Um, it's new, 
but it's rooted in Chicago. So this is this is a view of the park looking south. And what's kind of astonishing about it is that it has knit itself into the city so seamlessly. Um, even though the, the process is, as explained, was sort of uh, not driven so much as shoved and made up, um, the park has united an art, it has sort of created um, an arts district with the Art Institute and other institutions along Michigan Avenue. Um, Michigan Avenue, you may know, is, is cut in half by the Chicago River. And the north side, this is on the south side, the north side of the river is very popular among tourists who shop and they run up and down. But now with Millennium Park, people are crossing the river, they're coming to the south side and they're beginning, they're looking at um, cultural institutions and seeing Chicago with a new eye. Um, so, I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, Pritzker Pavilion. When Cindy Pritzker was first invited by the, the major donor and organizer of the entire operation, his name was John Bryan, and he was a former CEO of Sara Lee. Cindy Pritzker, of course, is um, one of the Pritzker family, and uh, which gives the Pritzker Award for Architecture. And Cindy agreed to get involved with this, but as Ed has pointed out, the, the plan at that time was very conventional, and um, Cindy wanted nothing to do with it. And that's when she involved uh, Frank Gehry. She said, if we had somebody like Frank Gehry, that would be the art. Very popular. And sort of downplayed the difficulties of building this thing. It's it's twelve stories high, and the. Um, I think the cantilever is well over 75 feet, 100 feet, 100 feet. And the, the uh, aluminum cladding that you see on there had to be laid precisely because these are, these are all curved plates. And you get this cascading effect if you're off by one hair's breadth. It magnifies as you go on. So this was done actually more than once. And here's Cloudgate. Um, I'd like to read two quotes about this. Um, first, from Anish. In order to get to the unreal, there's a lot of reality. There's weight, engineering, and the resolute pursuit of form and not letting go, not compromising, whatever the result. And the second quote is from Ed, and that is, it turns out, that artists don't really know how to make anything. <laughs> um, I would argue that, that this glorious sculpture um, would not exist anywhere else. In, in reinventing Chicago, we're also saying goodbye to certain parts of Chicago. Chicago was an industrial power, it was a steel center, and that's gone. But left behind were um, men from the steel industry, steel workers, who did this work. And I would be very surprised if there were a team anywhere in the world that could have accomplished this. In the course of this work, these guys became real artisans. <clears throat> I'm just going to read a little bit here. The fundamental challenge of Cloudgate was to make an exquisite, refined piece of art using crude industrial techniques and materials. 
Kapoor wanted the level of craft work one would expect to find in a finely made piece of gold or platinum jewelry. But he made, <coughs> but this was made out of stainless steel on a colossal, unprecedented scale. I'd like to tell you a little bit about what these um, workers went through as well. In the course of the project, these steel workers became artisans, approved, possessed of gifts so rare and refined that they may never have to use them again. They were get it dedicated to the work, knowing they were helping to make something exceptional. They um, were working, they had a thermometer in that tent, and I was in there, and it was 125. And after two days of that, they threw the thermometer out because nobody wanted to know anymore. They were holding um, machinery, you know, up above um, fine grinding tools that weighed like 20 pounds, and they were laying on their backs to do this work. Um, it was an extraordinary sacrifice. And in fact, when there was discussion about uh, finishing the sculpture at a less refined level, they they threatened to walk off the job. So their commitment was really extraordinary, and, and that's why I do feel strongly that this is really emblematic of Chicago in more than one way. Kind of great, huh? Now in this in this image you can see the um, the hairlines that define the the, the uh, plates, and when the sculpture went back into the tent again, as Ed described. These had to be um, welded from the inside, pushed out, and then and then sanded very finely. So if, if you went in, if you indented to any degree, you got what is called a wow, which makes this sort of distortion in the reflection. One of the most amazing things about this bridge is um, the accessibility issue. Um, in, in the States, this, this handicap law that uh, Ed was talking about, most of the buildings are, uh, you know, have build-ons to accommodate people with mobility issues. And here's a piece of architecture that is completely seamlessly meant to accommodate everybody. The original plan was to um, put elevators up at, at either end and that, so that the uh, handicap could be carried up to the level that would carry them over. The, the twisting shape of this bridge allowed them to get a very gradual rise so that it could be uh, traveled by people in wheelchairs without you know, forcing them to do something nobody else had to do. And again, this is right here. And here we go to the Crown Fountain. Um, this is really kind of brilliant reinvention, I think, of the of the town square. Um, Jeremy said, "There's a huge emptiness in the piece in, that is inviting people to be there." The Crown family, which uh, supported this piece was actually, at this point, people were so anxious to be participating in the park that the Crown family was afraid that they weren't going to get a chance. They, they were afraid that all the naming opportunities would be gone. And um, I think they, they got to uh, John Bryan Lickety Split to make sure that didn't happen. One of the big surprises of this, though, is, and even to Jaume, he, he was surprised, he said, at how the city has embraced this. But it was, I, I swear, they turned the thing on, and within 20 minutes, the kids had it figured out. What happens is, um, this is at sort of the end of the cycle, this huge cascade of water comes down over both of the towers, but 
in the middle of the cycle, the lips on the face perks and this plume of water comes out. So the kids stand in front of it and they get drenched and then they go, they go up against the, the wall before the cascade comes down. Somebody suggested a towel concession would uh, help. This is not something you'll ever see in Hong Kong. <laughs> we turn off the water. And this is a, um, this is a fairly modest project that was added um, fairly late in the process. And I can tell you about the, the delight of threading support through the girders. It was not easy, but um, these, these uh, loungers uh, have been replaced by bicycle racks. And the, the, the intention of this building is to support um, biking, reducing use of cars. And so people come here, ride here, they can get showers and change and then go to work. And this is the Lurie Garden. This is our green, green part. Um, this is also very native to Chicago. The, the, what uh, Pete Udoff, who Ed mentioned, the plantsman who designed this, his, his philosophy is that all plants should display their full range of life, that, um, that there's real beauty in the decline of the, of the plant as there is in its, its flowering. And um, he uses all native plants, so Chicago was a prairie. And these are all um, things that you would have found before Chicago existed. And what's interesting is that it's this combination of very natural and artificial. I mean, it's obviously not a real stream running through there. And the place feels uh, built up. And all of that's intentional. But then you have these amazing sort of drifts of plants. <clears throat> this is what Pete Udoff calls the uh, Blue River. And here we have the Harris Theater. The um, primary thing about the Harris Theater was that it be no frills. Um, and Tom Beebe, who did design this uh, because of the legal issues that Ed uh, mentioned, there was less and less of the building above ground. This is almost like this light box now that is just an entry to the building. And Tom complained that he was just getting pushed further and further below. But um, it's a very, very simple building. And uh, his friend, Larry Booth, s said, you know, you feel like you're going to a hockey game, and then you walk in, and there's an opera going on. Mm -hmm. So you can see this is very simple kind of industrial construction in the stairs. The theater is wonderful, though. I mean, there. Beautiful sight lines everywhere. There isn't, there really isn't a bad seat in here. So, um, what makes Millennium Park so brilliant is its combination of universal and particular. There's sort of the the, the steel in the sculpture, the garden, which is very midwestern. Um, this sort of Chicago famous can-do spirit that uh, kept this project going when it should have died. I mean, there were a million times when this project could have just collapsed. Um, it's brash and contemporary, and it's absolutely Chicago. Um, and in thinking about West Kowloon, I, I was so thrilled to see that Norman Foster was doing the plan because he gets Hong Kong, I think, like few architects do. Um, he gave you one of the most brilliant 
buildings of the 20th century. And he's given you a really great airport, too. Um, he lived here, I believe, when he was working on the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. And uh, he really understands this place. Um, because Hong Kong really is not like any other place, right? I mean, if you were if you were to stay in a car the whole time you were here, you may never know about the layering of the city. You may never know that one story out there are these little plazas where people are sitting under trees and talking. And you know, I was walking around last night, and there were just a lot of people just sort of hanging out comfortably in these these very quiet little green areas. And there's planting everywhere. Um, I can imagine uh, in your new area there. There's um, a lot of people doing work, for example, with, with vertical gardens, you know, gardens that go up walls. And I could imagine that being adapted in, in a brilliant way in West Kowloon as you think about your park. Um, the one thing I would say is, you know, don't let one guy do it. <laughs> you know, um, a lot of the vitality of Millennium Park came from came from um, just the variety of people that were working on it, and you know, accommodating those com competing sensibilities and resolving it was really, I think, one of the things that in the end made it so special. And I would not, um, I would be very careful, <coughs> excuse me, to get cutting edge architects and designers. Um, don't do a niche. He's old news, you know. Um, and it's avail yourself of experts. Um, there are things to be said for competitions, and there are things to be said against them. Um, there was only one competition, really, in, well, that's not exactly true. Um, in, in the Pritzker Pavilion was absolutely chosen by the donor. Um, we figured Cindy Pritzker knew something about architecture and she could get away with naming uh, Frank Gehry. In other cases, as in the Lurie Garden, there was a competition. But, uh, so there are things to be said for both. Um, but you don't have to be limited to that either. Anyway, uh, it's been an honor. Thank you. for the bridge over the Thames, which Norman Foster won, and Frank Gehry lost. So when he saw the uh, bridge that SOM had designed, he got a little more intrigued about uh, doing the project. And he said, you know, he told me the story about the competition. He said, he lost it. So uh, I used the opportunity. I thought, well, here's a chance. So I said, Frank, if you do the pavilion, we'll throw in the bridge. <laughs> and he said, OK. <laughs> so um, the park opened on uh, July uh, 16th of 2004. Uh, in spite of all the press, negative press, uh, the public came in droves. That first weekend, this is the first weekend, we had 300,000 visitors. Uh, they were really curious about the, the park the press had criticized for all those years. And they loved it. A week later, we had a giant fireworks display. We invited all the donors who had given money to the project to come, and uh, they could, we gave them two tickets. There was a performance by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and if they wanted to bring their families, it was a thousand dollars more a seat. So we raised about two million dollars out of that one event. And then, of course, the press uh, decided, well, maybe the project's not so bad after all. <laughs> and it's the reason why all these uh, condo projects were successful. Um, a lot of them uh, were the result that resulted after Wanning Park was uh, built. And suddenly this stretch of uh, Michigan Avenue, which uh, Cheryl mentioned, uh, was not very attractive, became a big uh, retail uh, area. 
and now we have a Starbucks next to a Caribou Coffee, next to a Bocce Coffee, all in a row. Uh, it's really had a terrific uh, impact on, on property and rents. Uh, Rents in apartment buildings adjacent to the park increased by 22% after the park opened. And this area has maintained a higher occupancy than any other part of the city. Uh, there's an increase in the population immediately surrounding the parks. Over 4,800 4, apartment county units have been completed, resulting in this area of a population increase of 71%. These two buildings, uh, this is the legacy at Millennium, only happened after the park was finished by the same developer who built one uh, a little bit further to the north. 460 units, all with great views to the park. This building was a commercial building. The top 10 floors were uh, uh, vacated and turned into condos. And they're planning on doing another 10 floors. One thing about this stretch of Michigan Avenue, all these buildings here are historic, so anything that's built behind them will continue to have uh, these great views of Whitefront and, and Lonely Park. The res residential value created by park views, if you want to have a view of the park, it's going to cost you $125 more a square foot. So uh, there is value in, in being adjacent to open space. And we figure that the total value of the residential property surrounding the park has increased by $1.4 billion since the park opened in 2004. Maybe the owners don't like that so much because their assessments are going up because they're adjacent to the park, but it's too bad. Uh, hotels, um, we've, they've added more than 80% more units since the park's inception. They're still building hotels since the park. Radisson Blue just opened a hotel a few months ago. We have 4.5 4 million annual visitors each year and many places to stay. This park stirred, spurred a development boom and it can be attributed to the number of people visiting the park. The view from that one condominium project, the legacy, is this is what they see. Four and a half million visitors also bring a lot of revenue to the city. Uh, we've estimated that uh, visitors to the park yearly contribute $1.4 billion of direct spending and $78 million in tax revenue. And that's only because of Money Park. We separated those numbers from other events in the park. But it's also important. One of the reasons why the park is successful is because of programming. Certainly the great architect in, in art uh, uh, bring people back and they can, doesn't have to be anything going on in the park to have people come there. But we also do uh, revolving uh, exhibitions. Uh, this one was by Mark DeSuvro. And the artists are so interested in having their work exhibited in Longing Park that they're willing to waive any fees. So Mark DeSuvro is probably one of the greatest uh, sculptors in, in the United States right now, uh, who's willing to loan his pieces for a two-year exhibition. And we've even had uh, exhibitions made by Chinese artists. This was a couple of years ago. Uh, if you notice, uh, it says right here, made in China. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, programming in the park also occurs on a regular basis. This is uh, uh, young students uh, at the Joffrey Ballet uh, doing a dance they, choreo they choreographed for the Crown Fountain. And as Cheryl said, the Crown Fountain is an incredible place uh, for kids. Um, I was thinking of actually opening up the towel concession. <laughs> it would be a conflict. And like everything in the park, uh, even the fountain is accessible to people with disabilities. Activity around the Crown Fountain, where they clogged uh, uh, in. And uh, people are compelled to touch it. We wish they would keep their greasy little fingerprints off of it. Because <laughs> it does cost us $30,000 a year to clean the fingerprints off of it. <laughs> so there's uh, custodians every day. They're sort of polishing these. We knew that would be an issue.
And uh, and Cheryl didn't mention that the McDonald's Corporation funded the bike station because they wanted to improve their image as a corporation with the most healthy lifestyles. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, uh, after a year after the park opened, they gave us uh, $4 million. Uh, $3 million went into an endowment fund which underwrites the exercise programs that occur every Saturday morning in the park. So a series of Tai Chi, Zumba, yoga, and Ronald McDonald comes uh, to kick off the program. He's got a shoe ready to kick there. And um, these people were instructed to do the golden arch. (laughs) And of course, programming, there's over 500 uh, free events that one can can take part in every year. 60 major concerts. This is a jazz concert. So there's there's a symphony, 30 symphony concerts with chorus. There's a jazz series, a world music series, a downtown sound series, which is sort of indie rock, and um, dance. The Chicago Symphony Orchestra performs a free concert there once a year. The Lyric Opera in Chicago does a free concert. It's just an incredible array of activities, including free programming for families. This is uh, underwritten by a Target company the department store chain in the United States. And free programming every day, five, five hours, are devoted to children and their, their, their uh, families that come and they can listen to music or uh, take part in activities provided by our local museums, all free. And uh, this is one of the art projects run by the Art Institute. As uh, we said, this is the new edition of the Art Institute, which was relocated uh, from the original planned uh, location to take advantage of its proximity to Monument Park. And then uh, this is the view from, from uh, the New Artists to Edition, the Modern Wing. And Renzo Piano, who did that, also designed a bridge which connects Monument Park directly to an upper level uh, sculpture terrace. And they've uh, decided that their attendance has increased because of this mm-hmm. connection. Uh, so people walk up that bridge, they uh, can go to the restaurant that's up there and, and see the free uh, exhibition, and then they go down the escalators and they're uh, encouraged to pay the admission to get in the museum. Although well, you don't have to pay it to get out. You know, it's, it's, go back down the bridge. And we continue to sort of look for opportunities to have uh, temporary exhibitions. This was one celebrating the, um, the um, Plan of Chicago 100th anniversary by Ben Van Berkel, UN Studio, did this. And, uh, and this was Zaha Hadid. That same year we did the pavilion that she designed. And so I want to leave you with this uh, quote attributed to Daniel Bernard. Make no little plans, they have no magic to stir men's blood. Make big plans, aim high, and hope and work. And I think that's a message that you should consider for the West Common Project. So we can, uh, I think we're going to sit down and uh, take questions. Or, okay. Thank you, Ed, you were there, and uh, Cheryl Kent, that was an incredible presentation. Um, maybe before we move on to the panel discussion, um, I was hoping to raise a few maybe questions um, for Ed and um, Cheryl. So perhaps you'd like to join us on the podium, and then we can um, invite our two guests. seems to be um, a, a real incredible transformation of Chicago f- through its identity, and I think um, it's very well illustrated in both of your presentations. Um, maybe a few things in terms of um, um, the planning process itself. Um, I believe it was extremely challenging, a lot of stakeholders. Um, it's not that rosy, um, I believe, but maybe you can paint a few stories of um, case studies more specifically to the urban planning 
um, to you know, kind of breaking the Daniel Gunn informal bridge, but still being able to produce the transition from gray to uh, landscaping strategy. Perhaps Ed, you can answer to these questions. Is this is working. Uh, the planning process for Money Park was a little convoluted, uh, and it's not necessarily the way I would recommend any uh, part of the plan. Uh, it started out with the SON plan, which was vetted with you know, hundreds and hundreds of meetings and citizens partaking in that discussion. Uh, they were just, in general, happy to, to see this ugly parking lot and railroad tracks be covered with new park space. So they weren't as engaged in what it looked like as opposed to um, what it became. So, and, and as I mentioned, we started construction of the garage, which is going to hold up this park without really having an understanding of what the final plan would be. It's not the way to do the park. Uh, but um, it evolved over time. We were designing as we were building. And uh, since uh, it was impossible to go back for full, full public hearings at that point, we did, uh, I was responsible for talking to civic groups, uh, not in general meetings, but to talk to their planning committees. I would show them uh, the project as it, as it evolved, and I would get their uh, consensus that uh, we were doing something that was going to embarrass the city. Uh, so um, that's how it went. And then in terms of the planning department, we would go and uh, I would show the plans to the mayor and get his approval, even though he was a traditionalist in his uh, taste. Uh, other people were paying for it, so he couldn't say a lot about it. But um, in the, in, with the BP bridge, every time I'd show him the bridge, he'd take a pencil out and he'd put a big X through it. And eventually, he would be, we won him around. Actually, it was the mayor's wife that convinced him that it was okay. <laughs> so I would meet the mayor and uh, get his approval, and then I would go to the planning department, uh, head of the planning department, and I'd show them the plans and say, well, the mayor's approved this. And of course, they would then approve it too. So it was my strategy. It worked fairly well. Okay. It's clear you have a very strong vision and strategy, a process of dealing with different stakeholders also. Um, one issue is the, the kind of culture of philanthropy. Um, yeah, and maybe Shelf. I just wanted to add something on the planning issue. Um, as Ed said, that it wasn't really planned so much as we were sort of constantly catching up. But um, for the way things are right now in the United States, where there, people aren't very inclined to spend money on common areas, it, it's actually pretty lucky that it that we did it this way. Um, if we if if Ed had gone and said to the city, we're going to do a project here that's going to cost over $400 million, I guarantee you it would have been shot down immediately. It would have been dead before it got off the ground. And um, even though some of the, the planning issues um, were serendipitous, they're still real. Um, this, this, as I, I said before, has connected North and South Michigan Avenue it's created a, a cultural zone, as I mentioned, but it's also created um, um, connections to the, the old city center, the Chicago Loop. Um, there are views that you'll see when you, if you go to Chicago where uh, the Pritzker Pavilion looks like this big sail at the end of Washington Street, and, and so it's announcing that, that presence, and that is the street that city government buildings are on. So. And you can see that thing from like two miles away. So I, it, it's, it's been very important in that regard as well. And just the fact, the very fact that you can have a 24 acre site in the absolute heart of a city that hasn't been developed, and when it is developed, it's developed for the common good. I mean, it still moves me more than I can say that. Um, this was not developed as a building or a series of buildings. If you, people are very excited about the High Line, and they have every reason to be, but it's, um, 
it's, it's rather meager in, in contrast. And at the moment, when they've decided to extend the high lawn, and it's making a U around a 27 acre site that happens to be rail yards, on which they happen to be putting a deck. And that deck is going to be all residential and commercial. And the High Line is more or less a device to, to um, animate that. Great. I think for Hong Kong, we have probably a, a different um, challenge in terms of infrastructure and the future of the audiences that will be participating in the West Canon Cultural District. Um, so maybe you can stay on the stage with us because we have invited uh, two other panelists to join us for the discussion and maybe we can engage with a dialogue um, with specific uh, questions and then we can uh, invite the audience to raise even larger questions. Um, we have a lot of members here. Um, so um, Colin Ward, would you like to join us on the stage? Colin is the partner of Foster and Architects who is um, uh, in charge of leading a team um, on the West Kelman Cultural District. Um, their plan was selected um, November 2010 um, as the kind of master plan, conceptual master plan for the future. So it would be wonderful for Colin to maybe spend a few minutes to share uh, your current uh, uh, strategies and discussions. And then Sarah Wong, would you like to join us, is a uh, board member of the Parasite um, Nonprofit Art Space in Hong Kong, uh, currently a lecturer at the Insti uh, Hong Kong DI uh, Design Institute, and is also an artist. And then Eric, perhaps you can join us and co-moderate um, the session. Um, one or, one or the issue is the, um, of course, the success and the measurement of success. Um, the Millennium Park, it's incredible. You do, I would say, over 525 free events. Um, you've managed to create extremely uh, sensitive, um, iconic, sculptural, temporary spaces, yet still manage to balance this incredible nature, um, etc. Um, so, with, with the current um, uh, West Kelowna cultural planning that I, I believe Colin, um, maybe you could uh, s sort of give a general sense for audience uh, both about the process right now and um, specifically in response as a comparison with uh, the goals and challenges and the successes from Millennium Park. Um, is that okay? Yeah. Um, can I just say, first of all, that was completely fantastic. And I just thought it was brilliant. I think it's one of the most um, uh, inspiring talks. I love the photographs. I love the photographs. So fantastic. So I like the photographs. Um, in comparison, uh, West Island, um, you've got a bit of catching up to do. Um, um, but we're, I suppose we're getting there. Uh, the, um, I just love the West Island guys who sat here in the room. So if I get some wrong guys, you need to just shout out and say, hey, so um, we're at the moment uh, submitted the uh, uh, time planning board application on the 31st of December. Uh, I think to the people of Hong Kong, we promised them we would submit it uh, at the end of uh, 2011. So 31st of December was a good day, so we submitted it on the 31st of December. Um, and that's now been uh, put forward to the time planning board, and there's been a number of meetings that, uh, that have been presented to them, and that's all uh, going through. I think probably third quarter, end of third quarter, we're still going to get the town planning and get approval. Um, so at that point then, uh, where sort of all stations go for the, um, for the land that's been formally given to the authority. And at that point then, hopefully the, uh, the bulldozers and the uh, pioneer weeks will start moving on to site and we can actually start constructing the board for the uh, So I guess that's probably where we are in case in terms of, sort of, of the process. I know in, in, there was a really interesting comment that Ed said about trying to get people onto the site um, early. Um, I think it's something that we, everyone is very aware of here. Um, and I, um, I often tell the story, so those of you who heard it, forgive me. The problem that we have um, with the West County Cultural District, uh, know, probably unlike uh, Millennium Park, uh, is that um, many people simply still don't even know how to get there. It's, it's an extraordinary thing. I was um, uh, from my office, um, um, so it's not too far from here, 10 minutes away on uh, walking. Uh, we got into a taxi at the bottom of the office and we said to the, to the taxi driver, can you take me to the West Carolina Culture District? <laughs> <laughs> the taxi driver was, what are you talking about? And then we, 
and then we had to go to the uh, nearby hotel and walk uh, because that was the only way to get there. So I think there's this extraordinary perception actually about people don't even know where West County kind of Coulter District is, um, and that's, so there's this kind of big uh, sort of gap in people's kind of mind map of the city. Um, you know, that people don't even, there's this kind of gap there. You can kind of see it when they're the other side of the harbor, but they don't really know where it is. Uh, so I think we need to try and sort of fill that. So I know there's a real uh, drive to try and get uh, people onto the site incredibly early. I know there's uh, some sort of temporary land grants that are being committed to try and get events on there. Some of those have already started, which is great. Uh, the Food and Wine Festival, which is a great event that happens here quite regularly, and uh, also gets people there. And a few other events, and some great jazz festivals that we'll put up with some of that have a great deal with that. Um, so there's an, an ambition to try and get people there as early as they possibly can, I think, to try and animate the site and, and, and sort of get it going, um, which I think would be, would be really good. Um, the other thing I just was, was really, um, uh, probably just before I stop, is what I thought was really interesting in parallel um, was um, the province of West County Cultural District, um, and, and in that sense there are 17 cultural venues that everybody here in the audience knows. Um, and we've always said that for us the, uh, the ambition was to make West County Cultural District uh, probably 18 venues or, or 19 venues, and the, um, the sort of the urban realm, the public space, the park, so the streets, the squares, the spaces, and, and the big park itself is, is the next, is the kind of the other cultural venue. So it's meant to be a, a kind of a platform for people to um, begin to um, uh, embrace culture in, 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 in sort of in, to the extent that they want to. Uh, so if you kind of an avid culture vulture, then we're just going to jump in there and embrace it. Uh, but if you're kind of a bit timid or not quite so, uh, so happy with it, or maybe slightly intimidated by it, or kind of slightly scared by it, then you can embrace it in a slightly sort of less direct way and sort of skirt around the edges. But it just gives people a chance to sort of really understand that culture is something that is actually part of everyone's life, hopefully, or it should be, uh, and therefore don't be sort of scared by it or think it's something to do with someone else. Actually, culture is you know, kind of a key part of everyone's life, uh, hopefully. And this is so the park and the public space is the sort of 18th venue, as we've always called it, it's meant to be uh, the platform to bring that to everybody free of charge. And that was kind of the, the whole premise behind the project in many ways. So therefore the, the Millennium Park is this kind of gleaming example of how fantastic that could be. I and mean, seeing the kids uh, playing in fountains and people looking at free concerts and how many, how many events it was, I can't even believe how many events you put on. It. I mean, it's extraordinary, brilliant achievement. And, and therefore it, it kind of just uh, kind of fills me with great hope that that's that, that the park and that's a great park, West Coast and Cork District, can kind of carry on that sort of fantastic idea of giving culture to people, um, young or old, uh, everybody, not so everybody, uh, rich or poor, it doesn't really matter, it's kind of there for you, uh, 365 days a year, uh, every day of the week, and uh, until dusk. Uh, and then that's kind of available to you, sort of, for, for the moment. So I guess that's always going to improve behind what you wanted uh, a great part of what's going on the district to be. So it's kind of a fabulous, it's kind of a fabulous benchmark. Yeah, I, I think that there's, I, I think there's wonderful opportunities too for the way that looking at Millennium Park, uh, how they really combine different programs together. So the park space and also together with the buildings, they start to meld together. It's hard to define one versus the other. In fact, I was reading before uh, that they call it the largest green roof in the world because it's, it's covering the railroad tracks and also the parking lots as well. And so it's really serving as a green roof to the, all this infrastructure below, but also that comes up and into the park uh, above as well. And as noted in the, the presentations, you can really see how each space is activated, not just once, but over time. And things like the gardens, what makes Pete's uh, work so inviting is that every time you go, it's always a different garden. And that he actually almost animates it through time. So if you go in the fall versus the spring, and he's very specific about how he plants things together. And you'll notice from the photographs that every time you look at the garden, it's always almost a different garden, a different space. And you can see that across the work. Uh, it isn't just the garden itself, but also, say, the, the crown fountain. In the fountain, you can see how it's activated. That's always almost a different face whenever you go. It involves Chicago. It's always participatory in those structures. Uh, same with Anish Kapoor's beam. Um, the, the, the structure of it reflects the weather. It reflects if it's raining or not uh, as well. 
and how people engage with it as a as an individual object. I've been to it many times, and every time I go, it's almost a different experience because the art that was chosen for the park, the structures that were chosen for the park, really reflect the fact that there's always change in the prints. And that's only reinforced by the pavilions. Uh, so the Zaha Hadid or the UN Studio Pavilion activated every time. And so every year if you go as a tourist or if you go as a citizen, it's always a different experience. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about this idea that the park is a static entity, but it's actually something that you always have to keep alive. It's something that you always need the board, not just to come up with the idea of a park in the first place, but actually how you activate it even further. Uh, I think that's the critical uh, success of Maloney Park, is the activation. And we try to uh, present programming that's going to bring people together. Um, so there's the variety, and world music is one example, where people are experiencing uh, music and ideas from other cultures, and they're really into it. Uh, uh, part of the, the beauty of Pony Park is the uh, ability of people to come together and of all sort of economic levels and, and ethnic groups, they feel very comfortable here, which is really important. And part of the success is also people watching. People come there to watch other people. And uh, we have a lot of foreign visitors, I'd say about 10% of the visitors, uh, maybe a little less, uh, are, are, are there from foreign countries, mostly regional. Uh, but uh, it also, the park also has created a sense of pride in Chicagoans. They, they are very pr proud about the park uh, because when their friends come to visit, the first thing they will say is, take me to the bean. Which is, uh, and it's also become the, the place to meet. You know, let's meet at the bean. So, um, <laughs> it's an honest before if you guys figured it out. <laughs> Yeah, and Anish uh, named uh, Cloudgate uh, a little late in the game. Uh, he has a tendency not to name his pieces until they're complete. So everyone in Chicago beat him to it, and it's the beat. Is it true? I think it's very nice that by building a park, and you sort of find the identity of the whole city, and also brought it over to across the globe, and everyone noticed about it. And uh, I, I think this is also Quite interesting that, uh, as uh, Edward has uh, explained, it, that through the process, actually, the planning process was a, a bit behind uh, from the construction. So also there was like, uh, um, didn't have this consultation process happen early enough to get enough uh, uh, like uh, consensus from the public and, and also get uh, enough uh, um, uh, responses from the public. And I'm really interested to, to see how, how this actually Really, people's uh, expectation is different from the outcome, but they still find it uh, very acceptable or, or they, they are enjoying it. And actually, I found this is very interesting uh, the trans transformation of the public's uh, point of view uh, onto the park. Uh, well, to respond to this, the, um, the, the drumbeat in the um, media, which was actually quite unfair, um, was such that nobody expected anything of this project. It was it was being cast as a boondoggle and as, um, three years into the project when John Bryan three years in after John Bryan had come in to start raising private money for this project, um, that's when the one of the newspapers finally acknowledged that there was money being raised, that it wasn't all uh, taxpayers' money. And it had not been for a long time. By that time, John Bryan had already raised $75 million. And the headline, I remember, was um, Cities Rich Kicking In to Bail Out <coughs> Millennium Park. <laughs> so with, with, so the, that's the context, right? When, it, so when the park opened, people were just blown away. They had no idea. It was as though this thing had been happening under cover of night. And um, yeah, so there were very low expectations and, and high rewards. I'd just like to mention that the uh, fundraising effort was um, sort of uh, developed around the idea of the turning the money. And um, the appeal was to the people who had enough money to, to give a million dollars. That was the minimum donation to, to give a name. 
Mark. Uh, you know, you've made your fortune in the city. Um, you've given to the opera and the, and the symphony and the art museum, but never to a public park that's some, that's there for everyone. And that appeal actually worked. And um, because they made their fortunes in Chicago, and now they can give back to everyone. I'd just like to add one more small point to that. Um, because if you, I'm sure you know something about Chicago's reputation. It's not known for the cleanest political activity. Um, so the, the very notion that, that people would be giving over $200 million to a park that was affiliated with the city is extraordinary. Um, it was a real act of um, courage and trust. So it, it, it's really amplified by the political nature of things in Chicago. It's actually fascinating. I was going to ask earlier, there's this um, sense of philanthropy and donations and ownership and this really interesting model of kind of public-private partnerships, it seems, you know, and of course the history of Chicago um, and its architectural uh, history and kind of bringing that into it. And I'm just wondering what, um, in terms of signage, it was interesting. You had these plaques or embedded graphics um, that doesn't speak too loudly that this is donated by. But how was that process actually, um, sort of as a guideline, how was that actually embedded within the system of designing um, the Vanden Park? I'm just fascinated by how you control. Uh, well, it was, uh, we started out the first uh, week determined as font uh, size letter, and there was no deviation from that. And every major donor got the same font, uh, same size letter. Uh, McDonald's was a problem because we had to deal with their marketing department. And, uh, <laughs> they wanted the golden arches in the park, and they wanted uh, the restaurant in the park, and we didn't, we didn't want any of that food in the park. <laughs> and uh, eventually, we, they, we were discussing it $4 million, and we told them, you know, you get our font and our size letter, or we won't take your $4 million. And they agreed. They were, they were committed. They decided that just having their name associated with the park at all was enough uh, of a marketing uh, advantage for them. So um, the park was successful. Four million visitors is a was enough uh, to uh, convince them that it was good, a good investment. And, um, and in fact, if you gave a million dollars, your, your, your name was put on one, in one location, two and a half inches high. So. <laughs> Seven and a half inches high for five. And, two and, a half inches high. and I would like to point out also that the, the tr tradition of naming things is not unique to this um, environment. I, if you walk through Central Park, you'll find the Trump ice skating rink. Um, and uh, oh, I'm just, just slip my mind. The libraries. By the way, uh, Trump was building his tower in, in Chicago at the same time. And uh, there was some discussion about whether we should ask Trump for some money. Uh, but we decided uh, we didn't want to. Uh, Sort of degradate the uh, site. <laughs> also, uh, I have a question uh, also about the private donations allowing the park to take on a little bit more risk as well. That I know with public money, you have to be much more careful of how you expend it and how you use it and how you apply it. But with private donations, sometimes it gives you a little bit more leeway. And when you go from a budget of $5 million for the honors before to 23. Sometimes I understand that that was necessary even to get the contract signed uh, and the thing built in the first place. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to even have it realized. Uh, certainly, a uh, private gift uh, allows you ultimately to win because uh, in the case of um, the Pritzker Pavilion, uh, there was a contract with the city. All of the engineering and Skid Rose and Merrill were in the contract with the city, but when Frank Gehry came on board, uh, he was not going to join, he was not going to do the project if he had a, had a contract with the city. So his contract was directly with the not-for-profit uh, that raised all the money, and um, and they had the 
ability to sort of fund that. Uh, they also had the ability to fund cloud gaming. It was, they weren't too happy about the fact that it was uh, costing uh, uh, three million, they thought it was going to cost five, <coughs> 23 million, but um, once you start building it, um, there's no turning back. And so uh, ultimately they just raised more money and uh, it worked. <coughs> And a lot of the costs were both escalating costs on the, the sculpture, for example, came from, you know, there, there, there was no model for this. Um, no model whatsoever. What Ed showed, um, the structure inside the, the, uh, the sculpture, but in fact, when, it, when the welding was finished, all of that structure went away. I mean, the thing is complete, that's complete integrity. We, you know, there is no structure anymore. No, I was, I'd be very concerned that the park would have been very conventional had it not been for an influx of, of private money as well. And, and there's always this dialogue that it could allow for. Was it difficult to convince the city that private donations were also an important, integral part of allowing for a different type of park? Or did they accept it from the very beginning? I, I think the mayor, uh, you know, he loved the Skidmore plan. I mean, that was. So, um, but um, when it became apparent that uh, the architects had sort of fabricated the number of what it would cost and the time it would take, uh, the project was in trouble in a way uh, because you couldn't even build the Skidmore plan for it. 125 million is what they said it would cost. So, um, so the mayor needed the help of the private sector, and uh, John Bryan was initially going to raise some money for a garden and some uh, public art. It was going to be a $23 million goal, a $30 million goal. Um, but um, as the project started evolving, and the first gift, which was Cindy Pritzker's, to sort of turn the pavilion into something extraordinary, um, it became uh, sort of the, the directive of the private sector and John Bryan's committee to sort of look at every aspect of the park and see if they could find a donor for something really unique. And had there not been a donor, that area would have stayed as a grassy uh, area. I mean, fortunately, we filled everything up uh, by then the project. So. We still have a few spaces left, so if anyone is interested in it, <laughs> to follow up to that, it, 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 I think it's fantastic, but I'm, I'm interested too, the, the people of Chicago, were they in any way um, bothered that, um, that uh, it's fantastic what she did, but, but in some ways she was saying, I want Frank Gehry to do this, and, and it's a public facility, and she's kind of saying that's what she wants. Um, were they, was, was there with the public of Chicago ever sort of saying, well, hang on, how can she get to decide? this, you know, with her favorite architect. I'm glad she did, but I'm wondering about that. <laughs> well, they didn't know she decided uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was, it was, uh, you know, she said, somebody like Frank Gehry. <laughs> <laughs> or some other prescribers. <laughs> so, uh, it wasn't too, too uh, known in the press, actually, that it was happening. But these, you know, there were criticisms. I mean, people you know, would, before the park was unveiled and opened the public, they're saying, "Well, why are these people giving all this money to to a park in the, in the center business district when they should be giving their money to feed the homeless and take care of the poor?" And yeah, and, and that was criticism. But I think now that the park is open, it is the public forum for Chicago. Everyone feels it's their place. And uh, I think that whole issue has, has turned around. Okay. Um, since we have uh, um, came up like, like, uh, about this um, sculptures in the park, actually, um, it's a little bit of uh, self-reflection after watching this uh, presentation. I mean, everyone, I'm sure everyone are impressed, very impressed by the crowd gate and the crown plaza <coughs> and the kind of effect or the, the kind of interactive possibility to generate for the people who use it. And then also I, I feel that it's the best example of like, um, I mean for us, we, we build parks, we build facilities for people, and then we always thought that, okay, we try to find out what people's need is, and we, we uh, do research, we do proper consultation, and try to ask people 
what kind of facilities do you want? And but at the end, actually, you found that mm, if you if you put it there, actually, people can generate a way to use it. Like the children that actually are standing there waiting for the water to come out from the from the uh, screen. And um, but this two very wonderful sculpture could not be made happen. I think is one is the kind of complexity in the in the stru structure and the technological support behind it. And I, I don't know, it's, it seems like there's nothing like that happening in Hong Kong ever. And uh, I mean, from working in this field for some years, I, I found that this is actually neat to have like engineer, um, architects, to work with the artists on this. And um, this is one thing, and I don't know in the future, how can we be able to achieve that by a proactive collaboration between different parties. And the other thing is, I, I found that um, one comment from Shelley uh, is uh, uh, inspiring. She, she mentioned that not every project needs to be done by public uh, um, competition. Um, I don't know, in, in Hong Kong at this point of situation, it seems to be uh, quite a topic of like whether this is uh, it should be a competition or not. In fact, I, as a part of public competition, yeah, it, it, it um, in a lot of way will uh, generate like idea open open up the idea platform. Um, so yeah, this this is another issue in Hong Kong. Okay, where did where Hong Kong can find our own proper way or our own model of uh, commissioning a massive uh, public art project? And the last thing is actually um, it's more a bit like this maintenance dominated situation of parks in Hong Kong. I mean, a, a lot of us will notice that like, I mean, a park, whether you can do something like an open pond or that kind of thing, it's not the uh, autonomy of the architects or the designer. It's more on the maintenance. Like with our, like, uh, um, people behind this big project has the power or the uh, delicacy enough to push something to be happen, even though the maintenance of the park is not allowed. It. Colin, you can answer where you are on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. Uh, we, um, uh, just a quick one here when you were saying about the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, fact that the, some things are done better without uh, competition. I thought it was also really interesting. I thought it would be really interesting in the general that um, actually Norman will hate me for saying this because what I'm about to say. Uh, he, uh, of course, we, we constantly tell the, the authority that, um, of course, we should do the park because that's part of our project. But actually, I thought it was, I thought it was uh, fantastic when you said, actually, don't let one person do it. I'm actually, it's normal, hey, for saying this, but actually, I think it's exactly right. Uh, I, I think it should be, uh, I think it should be done by all sorts of people just to create that incredible, just incredible sense. So I, um, I don't know how to look at it. Um, in terms of the, um, how, do you, uh, how do you create great um, spaces and within the remit of public space in, in, in Hong Kong? Marissa and I were talking about it on, on Monday, I see, in a, in a different forum. Um, the, um, uh, with the with great respect from anybody in here who's from LCSD. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I apologize for what I'm about to say. <laughs> LCSD are uh, an admirable group of people who try very long. <laughs> their whole, their whole uh, agreement is to reduce public space, which is zero maintenance. Um, <laughs> which, as you know, we're all human beings, are quite, we're all messy people, right? We kind of create mess wherever we go. So it seems that sometimes, uh, to me personally, that actually their whole agreement is to simply not have people in public space because we mess it up. <laughs> so they'd just rather we weren't there, and they can have very neat, tidy public space that no one's in, but it looks very neat and tidy and fair and clean up after. Um, so I think we need to try and overcome that idea that, um, uh, that uh, public space it needs to be uh, impeccably clean 24-7. Because actually, probably it's more fun if it's not quite so effective at the end, at least at the end of the day. I can clean it up then later, and maybe it's clean as well the next morning. Um, and I think uh, even some of the planting, uh, we talked to some of the LCSD guys about this, and there are, for instance, um, uh, issues where we know there are some public spaces in Hong Kong where the plants are chosen so that they don't flower. 
uh, because the flowers would fall on the ground. <laughs> Someone has to pick them up. So, 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 we're kind of trying to overcome that. I know the authority have been working very hard uh, to also overcome this issue. Yeah, <laughs> to keep the photos. Right. So we think the whole uh, premise behind the plot at the point is actually that it should be, uh, yes, the, the whole idea that it's a, a zero maintenance park is it's not what we want a heavily maintained park. Hopefully, and we want a park that you can uh, fly a kite, that you can walk a dog, that you can uh, uh, eat something, you can lie on the grass, you can kick a football, throw a frisbee, uh, do whatever you want to do. And I have to say that I, I, I brought, brought that up there. Being that I wanted to criticize the person, no, no, no. it's just I think that there is always a will from designers and from the, a lot of people from the public that wanted to make things happen. Um, but there is something that is essential behind to, to really, but they, they, they doesn't seem to be very up on the table. They seem to be just some little things they, yeah, that actually stop things from happening. Just on the maintenance issue in Glory Garden, we hope there was a fear that the cities uh, wouldn't be able to maintain it because it was a little too intense. So we actually, uh, the naming rights uh, resulted in an endowment fund. So the, the interest on the endowment actually pays for the entire maintenance of that garden. And in terms of the environmental, obviously Chicago has its own climatic challenges. Um, as you can see, it's super windy and frosty. Um, and I think for the Hong Kong issue, um, it's an issue of humidity and shading and still being able to provide enough pockets of spaces for leisure and, um, and stuff. So I don't know if you can update maybe us in the crowd before we open up to the audience to, um, to ask questions. Yeah, on your website. Yeah, I guess we've always, um, you're right, it's a, it's a huge issue. And one of the things that we've always tried to uh, say for the project is that it should be uh, it should be a, a Hong Kong a project launch in Hong Kong because it shouldn't just be uh, in the urban context it shouldn't just be a piece of uh, Chicago, London, Tokyo, Sydney, might have been jet fresh brought in and landed in Hong Kong. It should be born from Hong Kong. Um, and the same for the <coughs> Um, so the, the, the park itself uh, is, is the same, so the urban context is born from the, sort of the DNA of Hong Kong as we've always called it, and the, the park also responds to that as well, so that uh, there will be places where uh, maybe you can um, kick a football, throw a frisbee, or, or splash you some Frangles water fountain or whatever it is, but actually there are also many places where uh, you can sit under the shade of a tree or sit under the shade of a canopy or um, have a cup of tea underneath the shade of a tree or in the tree um, so that you can also then try and sort of get the shade from that as well. Um, and then it's kind of open enough to the breezes blow through from the harbour so it's kind of a breezy, cool, shaded place uh, for as many people as, as want to do that. If you want to go out and sit in the sun, um, that's fine, sit in the sun. But if you don't, there's opportunities to not do that as well, to try and sort of obviously just uh, somehow mitigate the sort of subtropical climate that we get here, which is uh, kind of quite harsh at times. Time for many questions from the floor. So Lewis is urging to raise his hand, and I will. And do we have um? <laughs> Can I ask two questions? The first one is for Edward. I remember asking you uh, this question yesterday, but I would like to ask you again in this forum. Um, what cannot? What is not allowed in the park? <laughs> Just about anything, everything. Uh, so we don't allow bicycles, we don't allow dogs, we don't allow skateboards, we don't allow... Um, we allow drinking in certain situations. Uh, flying kite, right? Uh, okay. kite. You could fly your kite at your own risk because there are lots of wires overhead. So you know, <laughs> um, but why? Why? No bikes and no skateboards? Because of uh, four million people. And uh, the dogs, um, we allow uh, dogs that are uh, uh, guide dogs, for instance, but no dogs. Uh, it's just, um, actually that was the mayor's decree. He noticed uh, 
you know, there's some yellow spots in the grass. And, and immediately said, no dog. So we had that close. But uh, with bicycles, it, with four million people uh, in the middle of the summer, it's just dangerous to have people riding bicycles. And skateboards, same with skateboards or rollerblades. So uh, those rules are established because of the intensity of use. You can do that in other parks, parks around the morning park, but not in morning park, just too many people. And street performers, busking? Yes, uh, we don't allow that uh, because uh, we have a lot of music events and we don't want competition where people are coming there to enjoy music. They don't want to hear somebody you know, playing a, a trumpet over the board. Uh, and we don't want people to have their hats out collecting money. This is a place to sort of be away from all that uh, activity. So we have an ordinance that prohibits that. And we do have some uh, performers though, but they are uh, they are auditioned and they're paid, so uh, they don't have to, to hand, have their head up, and it works rather well. We have one for another question. Yeah, I have another question for um, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Millennium Park, uh, the Millennium Park looked a little say, yeah. flat in compare in compared yeah. to the uh, uh, Foster concept plan yeah. for the Great Park uh, in, the, in the cultural district. Uh, after this, after hearing the presentation today, I found a lot of found the good things about having a more flat uh, park. It is quite more flexible to do different things, to change function uh, in different seasons, and it is better for say, accessibility, wheelchair user. Um, so, what you what uh, what what is your response to it in, compared to the foster design of you remember? That in the foster design, there one of well, more than one little hill, yeah, in the in the great part of the coaches history. Probably more than more than three, a lot of them. Yeah, I I I I think it's um, as I say, I I going back to the point I made earlier, when I thought that Gerald's comment about saying actually it should be designed by more than one hand. Uh, actually, it was kind of a very simple but kind of revelatory statement for me actually because I think maybe it's not being very sharp but, but actually I, I thought it was a really really interesting idea and I think when you bring all that together um, uh, it's um, maybe each one of those um, areas then is almost like the canvas for someone to, to design on and that's kind of against the way we always imagined it to be in my own naive way I imagine that would be one hand but actually maybe I think probably it's better not uh, and in which case uh, I guess what we've sort of said is we think um, the, the, the location that it has is this extraordinary location, you know, on that side of the harbour, looking back at this location, uh, which is one of the great urban views on the place of the earth. Um, and the harbour is arguably the greatest harbour in, in the world, but it's just sheer sort of excitement and sort of bigger energy. And it's kind of incredibly available to the people of Hong Kong. Kind of the harbour is it's kind of like Hong Kong's greatest natural defining asset in, in many ways. So the topography was all about trying to sort of give people the chance to um, uh, sort of uh, sit in many different ways and sort of be able to enjoy that, but also to try and provide a degree of sort of topography within within the park that, that was kind of fun and, and promoted other activities too. So um, it was it was about trying to not create in some ways a sort of simple flat ground because we kind of have that in, 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 in abundance in other places and therefore this whole idea what does Hong Kong not have? Well, Hong Kong doesn't have this kind of great defining urban park that uh, all great cities have. Hong Kong's a great city, so it's kind of missing out on that one. And that was, that was kind of, the, the, I suppose, the sort of genesis of the that this was all about. Um, but if then some of those um, sort of hills were to not be hills or to be something else, that would be completely fine. It was just about trying to create some, uh, I suppose, initial ideas of what, what could happen there. And, Maybe that's the problem. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's uh, something else. But it, it's a way of trying to say there's there's a way of viewing things, looking at things, different shapes, different alterations, different elevations. That, that this thing doesn't have to be a flat park. It doesn't have to be full of tennis courts. It doesn't have to be full of um, those things that tend to predominate lots of parks in in Hong Kong. That it's, this should be a different thing. And therefore, in some ways, it's just trying to suggest a different thing. It doesn't need to be like a Kang Park or Hong Kong Park. It's to be a, it, this is a different thing, um, and that was kind of what it was suggested. So um, it's really a very winding answer to a question, but as you, I suppose, in some ways, it could be anything, and I was simply trying to suggest that something new or something different. Uh, what is that? Is that's some great fun in the future planning, I guess. Thank you.
One thing I noticed about the park in general is it seems like it's not one park. It seems like it's actually a pocket or a community of several parks. And was that part of the mission from the very beginning? Or is that something that actually evolves slowly over time? And even looking at the image, you can see different pockets are being activated in different manner. Uh, that's actually traditional. Um, when the park was originally designed by Edward Bennett, they envisioned a series of landscape rooms, which would extend from smaller rooms along Michigan Avenue as you go to the east, they become larger and larger, to the grand space like around Buckingham Fountain. So this, these landscape rooms, which are pockets as you describe them, were, were places where you could insert uh, a new information <coughs> that would be contemporary. Can I invite um, someone on the floor? Joshua? Joshua? <laughs> There's a lot of West Kowloon cultural district. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Janice from West Kowloon. Um, got a question for Edward. What's the role of a design director um, in a project like this between an existing plan, uh, some quite strong designers, and architects, or artists, um, infrastructure needs, because it's a basic, it's quite a big infrastructure, and a vision? Did the design director come up with a vision, or did you mediate between the parties, or did you create a vision for, and lead people with you? How does that work? I did all those things. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I became the sort of de facto master planner after the SOM plan was uh, rejected, and my other role was to mediate between all the various designers as they their uh, adjacencies were being negotiated. So I had to keep them. Um, grounded and uh, soothe their egos <laughs> and not have uh, much of an ego myself. So that was, the, 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 I guess, sort of a skill I've learned after years of doing parks in Chicago. I'd like to add a little bit to that. Edward's uh, a hero really. I think anybody else would have killed themselves if such a... <laughs> 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 it's very, very difficult. And, um, I mean, you did do all that, but you also, the one thing that you brought that I thought was incredibly important was if you're training as an architect, you could, when architects came in with stuff that was unrealistic, he could say, that number is insane, you know, and there was no one else that could do that. And Ed was also in a position, having worked with the city and being brought in by the donors, where he could negotiate both those worlds. So. It was a really complex thing to do. Thank you for sharing that, actually. Um, we have time for, I think, two or three more questions. So, yes, uh, Dr. John Lowe from DC. I'd like to know, during the uh, construction uh, phase, were there many environmental issues to overcome? Even though it was formerly railroad property, it wasn't that contaminated. There was some uh, initial excavations had to remove some contaminated soil to dispose of it from a certified waste site. But we were actually, because there were two garages under the park, so the lower slab of all those garages was really covering up uh, lots of sins from the past. But uh, most of that was landfill that was actually reclaimed land that was in pretty good, pretty clean material. So there wasn't that much of an issue. age and gender, and so we wanted to pre-flex Chicago's population, that was the artist's goal. And uh, we had us use very specialized high-speed <coughs> cameras, and the School of the Art Institute did all the videotaping of the thousand faces that we have. Um, so people had to have a lot of trust in order to come down to the loop and sit in front of, in a barber's chair, actually, and, and have this director telling them, oh, now you should smile, 
know, you should pretend you're blowing out a candle. So it was director telling him what to do. And um, a lot of people wouldn't sign the release and because the fountain wasn't there. So they didn't really know what the future held. And, uh, and some people were just too ugly. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, so, so eventually, um, you know, we, we got all the phases, uh, and people were, were thrilled to uh, have their face. Now the biggest question, the most asked question about my heart is, how do I get my face on that phone? Anyone else with money? Yeah, $400,000 to do a faces. <laughs> We don't do it too often. And, and the faces uh, are randomly selected by the computer, so there's, we never know on purpose when somebody's face is going to be on because we don't want to get the phone call. So what time is my face going to be on? <laughs> so, um, and there's so many faces that even if your face was there, you'd have to wait several months probably yeah. before you were able to see your own face. And my face is there, and I've never even seen it. So. <laughs> Okay, one more question on the floor. Uh, indeed, I want to ask this question of, uh, for the West Ham district, but probably it's not the right place to ask this question. But, so I want to ask for uh, the experience from the Millennium Park. Uh, how can you, or, uh, or do you have any funding to ensure the involvement of poor communities? especially those people living far away from the downtown Chicago to join the different cultural activities of the park? Uh, well, we, we try to provide programming that is going to uh, bring everyone down to the park, and in fact it does. And uh, you'll see uh, poor people, it's, it's really a very inexpensive uh, afternoon because it doesn't cost anything to go to the park. You just have to get there. And, um, and public transportation is, is fairly easy in Chicago. As I said before, it's, it, even though people initially uh, were sort of skeptical, it's now everyone's park. And, and you see all these people mixing together. There's no uh, fear or revulsion event against being uh, next to somebody of a totally different uh, ethnic uh, origin or, or economic level. So there are lots of, lots of mixed mixture of, of everyone in Chicago. So it's, it's created a, um, an environment that really brings people together. That's a really important question because in Chicago, you know, we have enormous diversity. And this gets back to the point about the public square and um, the association with democracy because you bring people to one place, they see each other, and, and it's no longer you and them or whatever, it, it, you know, becomes humanity. And that's that's one of the things that happens in the park continually every day. And I, it's, it's really incredible to watch. Thank you. I think um, with the West Calvin Culture District, um, with their tagline of it, it's a place for everyone, hopefully that can answer some of the future questions. Um, thank you very much um, for speaking today. Thank you for the guests for their inspiring sharing and discussion. And that wraps up uh, today's uh, master talk. And hope um, you will stay tuned for our upcoming uh, master talk, which is uh, by Antonio Vito. So uh, thank you for supporting Hong Kong Science Program. And hope to see you soon uh, at another time. Thank you very much. <laughs>